This video is all about convolution. It's an amazingly simple operation, and yet it finds so much application in science and engineering for modeling devices, and also for processing data, image processing, sound processing, all kinds of signal processing. And in fact, it was even used in work early on from some of the giants in science, mathematics, and engineering. So it maps one function to another function. This therefore can be used to model the output of a measurement device when given some input signal. So for example, we could have a camera imaging uh, some scene and we end up with some photograph and the process of imaging some scene to give some uh, photograph can be well modeled by convolution. It can also be used to model how we record sound, uh, the quality of the output of a microphone, for example, uh, or an amplifier could be modelled by convolution. And even other diverse applications like medical imaging, uh, if we do a PET scan, uh, we could look at the radio trace uptake inside the patient's body, and we could model, using convolution, the uptake of a tracer inside the patient's body. Also though, convolution can be used to process or modify data in some chosen way. So for example, with digital signal processing, um, in the audio case, we might want to do low frequency boosting or high frequency boosting to modify how the sound sounds. Um, in image processing, we might want to sharpen or denoise images by using image processing and convolution can be used uh, to do those operations. In mathematics, even differentiating actually corresponds to doing a convolution. So convolution is also useful in dealing with differential equations. Um, in artificial intelligence, deep learning, convolution is now a very key building block, allowing us to do uh, mappings from image to image or from feature map to feature map in AI architectures. So again, I hope now you're very motivated to really understand convolution and what is going on. So I'm going to pre present two views of convolution that are mathematically identical. I prefer the first of these views, which I'll explain at length, and I'll also go into the second view, which is the same process, but just seen from a different perspective. But before going further, we need to understand how to understand functions as being composed of delta functions. So here I'm considering a discrete uh, signal here. This could be like a, an audio signal, for example, or a profile for an image. And we've got some value that depends on um, an integer index x for this discrete function. And so we have these discrete delta functions located at different positions where we can shift them. So here's a shift of plus three, a shift of plus four, and we can change also the amplitude of the delta functions. And that will describe any digital or discrete domain signal. Also in 2D, we could consider pixels forming images, and these are also delta functions uh, positioned at different locations, X and Y. And here I'm just showing um, a surface plot of what that image would look like. So 1D and 2D and higher dimensional functions can be represented using direct delta functions for the continuous case or discrete delta functions for the discrete domain case. So that's a real key background to understanding convolution, and I can point you to a video where I cover the delta function in more detail. Okay, so view number one of convolution is what I'm going to be, what I'm going to be calling input-driven. That's where we consider each input delta, um, each input delta function, whether in a 1D uh, signal or a 2D image, we consider each delta in turn and that could be a point or an impulse, depending on the context of the function, the signal that we're dealing with. And all we do is merely replace the delta function by a response function H, which is known in convolution terms as the kernel or elsewhere, depending on the application, can be referred to as the point spread function or the impulse response function. And that is all that is occurring in convolution. So if we had then uh, one of these input deltas, shown here for example, in the output we just replace that delta function with a kernel which of course itself can be composed of delta functions. So here I'm replacing one delta function by a collection of delta functions that's a particular kernel where the kernel would of course depend on the system that we're modeling or the particular processing task that we're doing. That depends on the context. <laughs> 
Um, in the 2D case, we'd be considering pixels. So just looking at one single pixel in a 2D image, it is replaced by the kernel or the point spread function. That is all that is going on in convolution. However, a, a different way of looking at convolution, which is mathematically identical, is to view it in an output driven way. So this is where we now consider the amplitude of each output delta in the output function as being found by a weighted average of deltas in the input. So that would correspond, for example, here, if this is uh, one of the deltas in the output function, of, co of course the output function would be composed of many delta functions. Any one of them is found by a weighted collection of input delta functions. And the weighted collection is determined by the kernel. And in fact, this is where a subtlety comes in with this output driven method, where you actually need to reverse the kernel to find the weighting factors for those input delta functions. The beauty of the input driven method is that we don't need to do any reversal of the kernel whatsoever. And so it's much clearer to understand in my view. But again, it is identical. So if we looked here at the output of a pixel value in an output image, for example, then we'd need to get a weighted average of the input delta or pixel um, inputs. And that's uh, shown by this uh, illustration here. This is visiting all of the locations, the output uh, pixels in the output image. And we're seeing that it is a weighted collection. That's that gray box. That's the kernel weights. And notice it needs to be a reversed kernel for this output driven approach. Um, these weighting factors are just multiplied point by point by the input image and then it's all summed up to give the output value. Okay, let's get into um, my preferred way, first of all, looking at it as an, in an input driven way and spell out in detail what is going on and build up to finding the convolution integral. I've just also highlighted on this slide that this input driven approach often makes a lot of sense for modeling devices like imaging systems, uh, whereas the output driven approach is often very useful when considering processing of data, where we're looking at a fixed point in the output and how do we arrive at that value given the input values. Okay, so let's go ahead then with the modeling example for imaging. So this is some um, light field, if you like, some scene that is being photographed. In reality, it would be a continuous function f of x, y, but just if you'll allow me for the moment to work with discrete functions here, I've got a value f, which is the grayscale intensity, as a function of pixel x and pixel y, which I can abbreviate as follows just by using a vector r to access any x, y coordinate in that input function. It goes through our camera, and then we get some photograph. No camera is going to be perfect, and it will... Um, be, uh, there'll be some loss, some degradation in the output image compared to the input light. And so we're going to call this photograph an output G, depending on pixel position X and Y, and again can be abbreviated as G as a function of a vector R. And so what we're going to do is model this camera by a kernel. So for example, um, if it's a very blurred camera, if it's out of focus, then this broad kernel here would be what is used to model what this camera does. And we model it in terms of its point response function or point spread function, which we'll go into in the coming slides. And we're gonna be calling that kernel H of X, Y, or more briefly, H of R. Okay, if the kernel were to be broader, then of course we'd have a more blurred uh, photograph in the output. And we'll, we'll be building this up in the coming slides to, to see exactly why that happens. We'll be calling this process then convolution, which will be an integral equation, which we'll go into in detail presently. But also you'll see that there's this very simple notation, because it's a very simple process, where we just say that the convolution is given by uh, an input function f convolved with some kernel h to arrive at some output function g. Now h in an imaging context um, is, a point, is called the point spread function or the PSF but you can just call it a kernel if in doubt. Right, let's build up towards the convolution integral. Here now is the real scene being uh, photographed and it's just uh, initially just a point source of light. If it helps, consider that as the night sky with just one star in the middle of the field of view of the camera. And therefore our input function f of x, y is just a delta 
uh, a discrete delta function, which is a value of one at that pixel and zero elsewhere. If we run it through the camera, then what we'll get is in fact the camera's point response or point spread function, which is just the kernel of the convolution model that we're gonna be using for the camera. So that output G is just the kernel when it's a point in the input function. Okay, so that's what I'm saying here. If the input F is a centered point, then the output is just the point spread function or the convolution kernel. So the output is just G is equal to H, the input function convolved with the point spread function. So a very obvious example. Now to point out that if that star in the field of view of the camera had been differently positioned, such as displaced to position X prime and Y prime, just uh, considering a different um, coordinate for that point source of light, if the delta had been shifted to there, then correspondingly in the output photograph, the response function would have also been shifted to that corresponding position. And so again, we can use a vector notation here just for brevity. And also I want to point out here the importance of shift invariance in convolution, which is that wherever that point source is in the input, I'm just moving it around there, then correspondingly in the output, the functional form is identical. The size and shape of the response function is the same. It's just the position of the output that maps and corresponds to the position of the delta function in the input. So that is shift invariance, which is really core to convolution. Now then, if we build up complexity of that input function by adding more point sources of light, for example, many stars in the night sky, or indeed just a few, if you like, pixels of that, that image that we're trying to take a photograph of, then uh, we now have an input function composed of four uh, delta functions positioned at different coordinates uh, given by xa, uh, ya, and then xb, yb, and so on, then what we get in the output, because it's a linear system, is just a summation of those kernels shifted to those respective positions of ra, rb, rc, and rd, as one might expect. So that's what I've written here. The output photograph is just given by the same basically as the input, except we have replaced each of those delta functions by a kernel or by the point spread function. Okay, now we can build up more complexity by saying, well, okay, we could also now have differing amplitudes for those input point sources of light. So I'm showing here that we've got some function value um, that depends on the particular position of each point source. So I've got a value f depending on position ra, a different value of f because it's now depending on position rb and so on. And these just basically, uh, this function f will just be describing the entirety of the scene that we're taking a photograph of. So I'll fill in the gaps in a moment, but here we're just saying it's point sources of different amplitudes that make up uh, the input function to the camera. And it should be no surprise again that therefore the output photograph uh, would have again four point sources or four point response functions with an amplitude of each of them that corresponds to the amplitude of the input point sources. So a very obvious linear mapping. In other words, if we were to double the intensity of one of these deltas in the input, then we'd have to double uh, the amplitude. So if we double the, in, the so if we double the amplitude of one of these input point sources, then we'd be doubling the amplitude of the corresponding output point spread function at that position. So this is a linear shift invariant system, and this is known as LSI or linear time invariant when we're dealing with temporal functions. And this is again a core component to describing convolution. Let's build up complexity further by saying, well now, instead of just having a few point sources in the field of view, let's actually fill them all in. So you can see here, I'm adding together many, many point sources of different amplitudes to create some general input light, in, light field, if you like, for the camera to look at. And so we're gonna describe that as a, a collection, a summation of delta functions shifted to all the various positions R prime, R prime just scans across the entirety of that field of view. And then we have a unique 
value f depending on the position r prime and so the value f will vary according to the grayscale value here and that's just a description of that input function so in the output what we get of course is a corresponding superposition of different amplitudes of the point spread function so therefore the output as we've seen from the other slides is just where we take the delta and replace it by the response function by the kernel h so that's why I'm pointing out here. Delta function gets replaced by the kernel in the output. And these kernels are, of course, shifted to the same positions as the locations of the points of the, of the delta functions in the input. So therefore, we're describing the input as a sum of delta functions, here discrete delta functions, with varying shifts and various amplitudes f for each shift position. And therefore, the output is correspondingly a sum of kernels shifted to the same positions with amplitudes directly matching the amplitudes of the input delta functions. So let's build this up now by saying, well, it should link very obviously to the continuous domain, where instead of now having a discrete summation over all the positions of pixels r prime, we can now consider a continuum, a continuous range of positions r prime, or in general x, y, and now we can therefore have a continuous function f of r prime and now we're dealing with the continuous Dirac delta function so that sigma uh, capital sigma for summation just changes to this elongated s for summation that is the integral and we're using dr to show that we're continuing that, that we're doing the summation over a continuous range of r prime values therefore the output which is the convolution integral um, again we've just replaced the delta with a kernel and so that is the convolution integral which i hope you can see is very easy to understand just by this replacement of deltas uh, replacing them by the kernel however it's also very useful to understand convolution in an output driven way up to now we've been looking at different input delta functions and seeing how they get replaced uh, by response functions or kernels in the output. Alternatively, we can say, well, let's take a fixed look at a particular position in the output and see what that value equals in terms of the input. And this is where we'll get into a more conventional description of convolution. Okay, so I'm going to use the example of image processing here and say that imagine we've got some blurred photo and I want to process it with some kernel uh, to sharpen it up. And so this kernel will have negative values in it um, I've exaggerated the size of it here. It's only three by three pixels, so it'd actually be very small. So let's take a look again. The output is exactly the same expression that we've already been looking at by saying that the output is just given by the amplitudes of the deltas in the input, where the deltas have just been replaced by that convolution kernel H. So this equation is still true for the image processing example. It's just that what we tend to do when we do image processing is say, well, actually, I want to find the value of G, the output, for a particular location R, just in one go. Just uh, step through R, tell me the output, rather than step through the input and tell me the output. Here, we're just stepping through the output values. So let's take a look at what happens if we step through the output values. So imagine we're considering the center pixel where R is equal to zero, for example. Then we set R equal to zero here, and we end up with this expression, which is very interesting, it says, take the input function and multiply it pixel by pixel, point by point, by the kernel. However, notice the kernel now has a minus in its spatial dimensions. So in other words, we need to spatially reverse the kernel in order to then multiply it point by point with the input function, sum it all up, and that will give you the output at that particular location, for example, r equals zero. Therefore, more generally, fixed location r, we can say, take the input function, multiply it by a reversed kernel shifted to the position of the desired output value. So that's what I'm putting here by saying, if output driven, in other words, calculating g at a fixed location r, we need to reverse the kernel. And that corresponds to that animation that I showed earlier, where what we're doing in the output driven method is that we're fixing the pixel in each output location and saying that the output is given by the kernel multiplied point by point with the input image here, which is here is the, is the blue pixel values. They're multiplied point by point by that kernel, which is shown in gray here. 
and then you sum it all up to get the output. It's just that strictly you need to reverse that kernel. I'm showing here a symmetric kernel, which is often used in fact, in which case this reversal doesn't even need to be done, but generally it does need to be done and is important to note. Um, so just to show that example again, um, now for the context of denoising uh, pet images here. So I've got a noisy pet image. What I can do is say, well, an output of a smoothed denoised version of the image is given by a neighborhood average given by some convolution kernel here. And you can see it's taking the center pixel and then it's four nearest neighbors. You can see it's taken from that neighborhood there to give the output value. Now, of course, we could just say, well, take this and replace each delta function by that point spread function or that kernel to get the output. And that would be identical. That's an input driven approach. Here I'm showing it as an output driven approach though. If the image had been noisier as shown here, then what we could do is use a broader kernel to do more neighborhood averaging and therefore achieve more noise reduction as indeed would need to be the case for a noisier input image. Convolution, though, is still a very flexible method because, as already implied in that earlier slide, we could also use it to sharpen up an image. And so here I'm using a kernel with negative values involved. So that means we've got a blurred input image here. This is just a collection of deltas of different amplitudes. We can weight them in a neighborhood with negatives now in order to arrive at a sharpened uh, set of output pixel values. And again, I'm showing there for emphasis that each of those output locations is a weighted uh, collection of the input point sources or discrete delta functions. Okay, let's move on now to 1D convolution, often used in electronics, amplifiers, uh, audio signals, digital signal processing. Here I'm looking at continuous time and I'm just showing example inputs to some linear system under tests. So that could be an amplifier, for example. If we put an impulse in, so that's a continuous delta function, then we're going to get what's called the impulse response function. But in terms of convolution, more generally, that is just the kernel of the convolution. And that impulse response function is uniquely associated with the system that we're testing. So in all those earlier, exa earlier examples, we had, for example, a camera, and the camera was defined uniquely by its convolution kernel. Uh, with the processing, whatever task it was, denoising or sharpening, you had a unique kernel associated with it. And so likewise here, this unique linear system being tested, for example, an amplifier, will have a unique impulse response function, which we are using to model how this system handles any input. And the point is, of course, that those inputs are just collections of delta functions, or in the case of time, we often call them impulses, of different amplitudes and in the output we just have a summation of response functions. So that's what we're seeing here. The output in time is just given by the input uh, set of impulse functions, each of them as amplitudes for the impulse response function shifted to the respective location in time of the impulse input. Okay, let's look now at audio DSP because that's another time-based example. Now we're dealing with discrete functions. So I've got uh, uh, square brackets here. So this is an impulse input. And just to point out that we could do two quite useful operations. One would be, for example, high frequency boosting, where what we would do is define a convolution kernel that we choose to use. So rather than modeling a system like an amplifier or measuring it, to see what a system does. Here we're now deciding how to process um, an input signal. So if we wanted to process it by doing high frequency boosting, we would use a kernel that has negative values in it. So that's very much like the image sharpening example that we saw for the imaging context. If we wanted to do a low frequency base boosting, then what we could have is a positive valued impulse response function as shown here. And that's very similar to the smoothing or the denoising example that we saw earlier for the imaging case. So just to show the link between the spatial imaging uh, examples and now the temporal, for example, audio uh, examples. Okay, I want to now uh, finish by going through a MATLAB example to really illustrate what's going on with these two views of convolution that I've been emphasizing all along. So here is the convolution integral. 
and I'm going to be considering some input function, which is a, a, a square pulse shape here with a kernel given by this kind of exponential decay, where I've got an asymmetric kernel, which of course will be useful for showing the difference between those two views of convolution that I've been talking about. I'll start off by talking through the input-driven approach to understanding convolution. So what we're going to see here is that I'm going to be visiting all of the time points in that input function f, and I'm basically going to be using uh, the value of the input function at each of those time points to use it as an amplitude of the kernel h, which is shifted to the position that I'm currently considering. So you can see here in the example, I'm just using this kind of dashed uh, line here to indicate where I am in that input function f. And at the moment, as I go along here, you can see that the value of the function f is zero, which means I'm shifting the kernel to that position that I'm looking at there, but notice that the amplitude is zero and so there's no output. I just keep progressing along, and as I progress along, considering each of the input function values, so that's like um, in the equation at the top there, as I'm going along here, that's considering the different t prime values that I'm visiting in that function f. And then here, what I've got here is h of t shifted to that corresponding position t prime of that dashed line. So as I continue along, I'm still adding together functions with zero amplitude here, and so there's zero output. But then suddenly when I hit the function, now I'm here and I've got a value of one in that input function, so f of t prime is equal to one. That is the amplitude for the kernel h of t shifted to position t prime, and so that then goes into my output. And then I keep going, just adding together values of 1 for each of the shifted kernels in that region. So I'm just constantly adding together the kernels. And you can see here I'm just shifting the kernel to the various position t prime in the function f. And I'm using that as an amplitude or coefficient for that shifted kernel to add it into the output. So the output that you're seeing formed there is merely a summation of shifted kernels with different amplitudes, where the amplitudes are determined by that input function. So notice there's no reversing or anything going on there. It is a simplistic substitution of delta functions. You can consider that input function as composed of impulse functions or delta functions. And all we're doing is replacing them with the kernel shifted to the location of each of those impulses and adding them together. That's it. Okay, so I'll complete that example there by running that to the end. Right, now here I'm going to show on the right-hand side that this is identical to doing uh, the reversal method, where we're now doing an output-driven approach. So in the output-driven approach, instead of... So in the input-driven method, we were visiting different input locations to look at all the delta functions. In the output-driven method, we're now visiting, if you like, the delta functions in the output function g and saying at each point here what is the output value. So to do that, as we've talked about before, what I need to do at any particular location, so let me just uh, move this along a bit. So imagine we're now at this position here in the output, we're just sliding across the output values. So if you like, this is g of t, we've got the t axis here and we're visiting all the time points. Now at this position here, to find the output, what we do is we reverse the kernel because we need h of minus t prime. So this here is h of minus t prime shifted to the position t that we're looking at in the output. And you can see that I flipped it or reversed it because that kernel is actually lap, um, looping back in on the other side. I could have zero padded to avoid that, but I'm just showing uh, a very realistic situation when you get to using, for example, Fourier methods to do convolution. Anyway, so to visit the output value, um, to find the output value, what I'm doing is taking the kernel, reversing it, and then shifting it. And so you can see I'm shifting it along here. So that when I'm at the output here, here's the reversed kernel. So that's um, h of minus t prime shifted to position t here. And then what's happening is it gets multiplied by that input function, but notice that input function is zero in that region there, corresponding to this region between 0 and 50 here. And so therefore, when you do the multiplication of those two functions, you get 0, 
and when you sum that, get the area onto the curve, you get zero. So that's why I'm still getting zero output. But now, as I keep shifting that reversed kernel, suddenly here, when we now meet uh, the input function, therefore, this reversed kernel, when multiplied by that input function, will just give us um, the, that part of the input function there multiplied by that part of the reverse kernel. I take the area under that and I plot that at the bottom here. So I keep going and you can see here, so for example in a central position here, I've got a reverse kernel multiplied by that input function. That's this result here. I take the area under the curve and that gives me the single output value for that shift position. So I'll keep going. Um, until I get outside of that function. But notice the tail is still going back in, and so I still get a finite product. And so when I take the area of that product function, I still get an output here. So you can see as I keep going, that what happens is I get an output-driven result of the convolution, which is absolutely identical to that far simpler input-driven input approach that I've been talking about throughout. So I'll finish by going through various expressions for convolution. So now you should be very familiar with the, uh, the convolution integral, where we're saying that the output is just a, a weighted collection of kernels shifted to each position x prime in some input function. So here's the input function. We visit all the positions x prime within that input. We take the value f at that position and use it as a coefficient or an amplitude for the kernel h of x shifted to that position. And then we're adding together all these h's, h of x functions. And so we get an output, which is a function of x. x prime, if you like, is a dummy index, just visiting all the locations in the input, shifting the response function to those positions and adding um, them all together with the values of the input function. Uh, there is the expression for continuous time, so very similar. For 2D or 3D continuous space, um, I'm just replacing x prime uh, with a vector. So this could be uh, x prime y prime or x prime y prime comma z prime. In fact, for any dimensions that you care to use. Um, for 2D or 3D discrete space, uh, instead of the continuous integral now, we just have a summation over discrete um, the discrete domain given by x prime y prime, the vector r prime. And for the explicit 2D discrete space description, we would get a, a description as follows. So that's all I wanted to say about convolution. I hope you've now got a very good grasp of two main views of convolution, the input-driven or the output-driven approach. And also you've got a good understanding now, I hope, of how you can use convolution to model systems like in imaging or sound systems, as well as using convolution to do processing, to do any desired process of interest to you. And I'm just finishing here by just reminding us of some of those giants of science, mathematics and engineering uh, who used convolution in their work, even though they didn't refer to it as convolution at that stage. So many thanks for listening.